Welcome to the Islet Hub podcast, where we will delve into the world of evidence-based knowledge on English language education in Quebec. I'm your host, Anita Aloisio, and today we have the privilege of diving into the world of education research with Dr. Paul Zanazanian, an esteemed associate professor in the Department of Integrated Studies in Education at McGill University. He looks at historical consciousness, intergroup attitudes among Francophones and Anglophones, and the English-speaking community's quest for vitality, giving him a specialized expertise in problems of history, community, and identity in such complex societies as Quebec. His work as a professor includes an important social justice component as he seeks to develop strategies to overcome obstacles that limit fundamental rights and freedoms, human dignity and authenticity, as well as all forms of cooperation that lead to improving the quality of common future life. Hello, Paul, and thank you for accepting to share your work and expertise about Quebec's English-speaking minorities, specifically in relation to Quebec history and education. It's wonderful, Paul, to have you here. Thank you. Please give us insight into your research interests and particularly what led you to focus on the topics related to Quebec history. Well, thank you for inviting me. I work on, as you mentioned earlier, something called historical consciousness. It's a concept that refers to how people, in my understanding, how people in their everyday lives give meaning to time or the flow of time, how we interpret temporal change and how we use that information to inform us about the world we live in and how to navigate that world. So I'm interested in how we use history to construct knowledge of social reality and how we use that knowledge to position ourselves regarding different life situations. How do you relate those interests within the context of Quebec history? Well, I can maybe talk a little bit about my own life experience. I moved to Quebec when I was 12 years old, and I came here and I had to immediately go to French school, which was a great thing because I got to learn French. I used to live in Cyprus before my family moved to Canada, so I was already very fluent in English. I grew up speaking and thinking in English, and I learned French in Quebec, so I'm fully bilingual. But as most immigrants coming to Canada, we carry a lot of baggage, I assume I could say that. And some of that baggage could be interpreted as uh, intergenerational trauma. So on one side of my family, my most recent ancestors were survivors of a genocide. Those experiences obviously could have a toll on people's capacity to act in more or less a normal way, normal in quotation marks. So obviously that the horrors of losing your parents and forced migrations into the desert, et cetera, et cetera, could really have a toll on how you kind of engage with the world. If you have children, that can influence how you bring your children up. The pain, the hurt, the fear, all sorts of emotions get transmitted through not only the education we give our kids at home, but also through our DNA. One part of my heritage inherited the consequences of genocide. And the other half of my heritage came from a majority group that was part of a huge nation state that could be termed as a empire. So I had this side of me that was impacted by the legacies of genocide be it positive or negative, mostly negative. And I was also impacted by a part of my heritage where uh, they were the winners and the people who were in power and in control. So I always had this interesting tension within me. I grew up at one point not liking the community I belonged to, a feeling that like, they were traditional, they, they weren't cool, they were old school, superstitious. And sometimes I would want to deny that part of my identity. But all that to say is that when I started my PhD, I thought I would get a degree in genocide studies. And then my co-supervisor suggested that I look at the concept of historical consciousness, which I found fascinating. And I thought, this is exactly what I want. This is exactly what I need to better understand this part of me that's ambiguous or I always felt like I lived on the margins, didn't know how to fit in, didn't want to fit in, but at the same time, I did. So I did all sorts of things to fit in and not fit in, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought, why not? Then I went to this week-long seminar on genocide education at OISE in Toronto, and I did not like it. I felt sick. There were people who witnessed the Rwandan genocide who were there, and they showed us documentaries. 
and I just couldn't deal. I remember I went outside and I was crying. I couldn't stop crying. I was like, what? this? I don't want to do this. Why would I want to spend the next 20, 30, 40 years of my life studying human horrors? So when I came back to Montreal, I was doing my PhD at Université de Montréal. I spoke to my co-supervisor and my supervisor about it. And then I decided, you know what? I can still study historical consciousness, but I'll look at it within the Quebec context. And the fact that I don't have an English or French sounding name permitted me to make certain statements or reflections on the dynamics between both French and English. So I was able to say things that francophones and anglophones were not necessarily comfortable in saying. And uh, so that led me on this path. I'm happy that I was able to focus on Quebec because it permitted me to take critical distance from the whole work I was doing. Because if I think if I was focused more on my own heritage and that intergenerational trauma that I inherited, I think I would have not been able to have that humility as a scholar maybe, or be more, not objective, but be able to be more reflexive in a way where I was more authentic or true to myself. It's so interesting that you include the intergenerational trauma as part of or an element of your journey and your decision to want to look at it through the lens of, you know, from the Quebec perspective, uh, which is such a complex and distinct situation. And I wonder how you would relate the work, your past work and the current work that you're doing right now to the English speaking educational community. My work is headed into a more theoretical and methodological direction. Quebec is rich when it comes to studying historical consciousness because you have questions of identity, questions of culture, questions of language. And francophones are very interesting to study because there are, as we all know, within a majority in a sea of English, and they have this determination, which I think is wonderful, to protect their culture and their language. But if you look at English-speaking Quebec, it's even more interesting because they are a minority within a minority, but they're a minority that is viewed as part of a majority. And they never really identified as a minority until the language laws of the 1970s. So English-speaking Quebec, in all its diversity, is a recent sociological minority that is now seeking to vitalize or regenerate in an autonomous and distinct manner as a historic minority in Quebec. Most people inadvertently associate English speakers with the majority group in Canada, and also with the privilege, the ultimate privileged group in North America, the sources of white supremacy and systemic racism. And in many ways, uh, there is that legacy. But at the same time, English speakers in Quebec, especially those who've been here for uh, many generations in the eastern townships or in other regions, they're everyday people. They're, They're people like you and I. And it just so happens their political leaders, the people who spoke the same language they did and practiced the same religion they did, like the elite, the economic elite, were not nice. And they did really subjugate francophones in many ways, hence the quiet revolution and the language laws. So English-speaking Quebec is interesting because they have that legacy of being very privileged and then the challenge of finding their space in a territory where the majority group can be seen as being somewhat fragile, depending on how you look at it, seeking to maintain themselves. So you have two historic communities, French speakers and English speakers within the territory of Quebec, that ever since they colonized the province, have been seeking to maintain themselves, but have also been in a struggle to develop a common civic project to live together, whether they liked it or not. And as time evolves, this French-English dichotomy, in a way, has become reified and has forms the basis, in many ways, of the French-Canadian historical consciousness. Both English and French speakers today are looking for social justice, in a way, and they may feel marginalized in many ways, but they're not as marginalized as First Nations communities or such historic communities as Black Quebecers. So if we look at the history of French-English relations or the history of intergroup relations between majority groups and more subordinate groups or minority groups or marginalized groups, all groups, all people who self-identify as members of a given group seeks, in a way, I argue my assumption, is that they seek to feel complete and fulfilled as individuals and as members of that community. 
And they do that to maintain their sense of integrity and dignity. So the Quiet Revolution was a social justice move in a way. The language laws that were brought in could be seen as measures of social justice to help improve the standing of French Canadians, to help improve their socioeconomic mobility, which was greatly lacking. So what they did is they created a common curriculum. And when it comes to the history program, prior to the Quiet Revolution, people who spoke English and people who spoke French didn't necessarily mingle, and they had their own schools, and they were taught their own histories. When they created a common curriculum for Quebec, what ended up happening is that the collective memory or the historical experiences of the fr uh, majority francophone community ended up informing what was to go into the program. So instead of creating a common history where both English and French speakers at the time brought in their different perspectives and created a, a common understanding of their common past, it was more of the imposition of the one group that used social justice to move up the ladder. They imposed their historical memory onto everybody else in the province. Part of the program was to also teach students the historic method so they could kind of question, disrupt, and have more of an analytical approach or critical approach to understanding history. And with time, two different interest groups ended up being created. Those nationalist-leaning inter interest groups versus those who wanted to be more open to diversity. So the nationalist-leaning interest groups would always argue and clamor and say there's not enough Quebec content. And then you have those who represent minority perspectives. They would argue for we need to bring in more different perspectives. We need diversity. So that's, in a way, kind of the story of the history program. And at one point, we had the history and citizenship education program that came into being. And that was a very interesting program because the basis of that program what lay at the, at the heart of that program lay an understanding that reality is complex and you want to give students the, the proper intellectual tools to be able to engage with that reality and make sense of that reality. And the way to do that would be through teaching them how to think like historians. So they would first experience history around them, use that experience to come up with questions, and then once they had questions, then they would go ahead and investigate, interpret, use the historical method, or even bring in oral histories and testimonies. That, in turn, would inform their civic engagement or their orientation in time. But with that program, nationalist-leaning interest groups felt that the focus on Quebec as a nation was not strong enough. The cliché or the standard example is that the conquest was replaced with a change of empire, and so they, they felt like there was being whitewashed. So they replaced it with the current history program, the History of Quebec in Canada program. And the premise for this program is that historical truth is hidden under different layers of reality. So the premise is that historical truth or the true history, the true understanding of the Quebec nation is hidden under many layers of complexity and teachers have to teach students how to peel off those layers and get at the true story of the Quebec nation. It's part of their historical consciousness. Sometimes they're not aware of how their historical understanding of their past or how history works informs them. So th I think what they're doing with this program is reminding French Canadians or Francophone Québécois of their own story. So I don't think their concern is really integrating or assimilating, rather, English speakers and minority groups. It's more reminding their own people that they are survivors, right, since the conquest. Prior to the Quiet Revolution, uh, the Catholic religion had a strong place in society. And with the Quiet Revolution and the introduction of the birth control pill, with time, Quebec's birth rate, or the Francophone Québécois birth rate, greatly dropped. Instead of having many children, there's this like huge decrease in the natural birth rate. I sometimes joke, and maybe that there's some understanding to this, is you no longer have priests, but you have history teachers in Quebec high schools. And the new religion is no longer the Bible, but the Quebec history program. So this history program is a social justice move to help maintain the Franco-Québécois identity in a way, and to help remind their own children that they're French. When immigrants start coming into Quebec, and then they start becoming bilingual instead of automatically just only speaking French. You have that fear that like, oh my God, we have a low, a weak birth rate. It's not a healthy birth rate. And now immigrants are coming in and uh, they're not speaking French. So you'll have almost, if not a majority, but a 50-50 presence of children that are uh, either from first generation uh, immigrant parents or uh, second generation immigrant parents or have just arrived. And so they 
do not really belong to this Franco Quebecois identity. So really, who are they? They are actually preaching to the immigrants or the descendants of immigrants with the History Quebec program. I think the first concern, and this is me through my years of reflection and analysis and research, but it, it's just, it's my idea. So one could argue, perhaps, the way that the history program is devised, right, peeling the layers of complexity to get at that one true story of the Quebec nation is also is destined for immigrants and newcomers to the province. But I think ultimately it's also a fear that their own children don't know their history. I would argue in any context where you have intergroup dynamics happening, it's always your community that comes first. I think the primary concern, I would argue, is to remind uh, their own children that this is your story, don't forget. And then also to remind newcomers to the province, this is the story of the Quebec nation. And if you're going to be a Quebecois, then you need to adhere to the story. This is who we are and this is who you will become. So in a way, there's not fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with that in the sense that that's how different societies function. Like the whole purpose of history education is to promote future generation, uh, future generations of citizens who are going to be loyal to the state. Could you talk more about a chapter that you recently wrote titled Le programme de formation à l'histoire de Québec comme objet difficile. Témoignages d'enseignants anglophones sur leur sentiment d'exclusion et la fermeture d'esprit. So the study involved me interviewing um, 18 uh, teachers who teach the History of Quebec and Canada program in English in English language schools across the province. And I offer the testimonies of four teachers. So when I looked at the data, I was trying to find ways of making sense of what the teachers were saying. I wanted the research to be relevant and to take it in a different direction. So I thought maybe instead of trying to analyze <laughs> and Go, go into greater depth, I said, why not use it at face value and basically use that as testimony to help raise awareness of the different uh, lived situations that English language history teachers, teachers who teach the Quebec Canadian history course in English and English language schools, live the experience of teaching a history program that basically reinforces the majority group's story at the expense of their story. So how do they teach a history where they are seen as the other, as the bad person? And then how do they use that information to integrate their students into society and also to help them pass the June exam? So not only are they learning a story where they're the bad guys, but they also have to pass the June exam to get their high school diploma where they have to kind of reaffirm that, yes, we are the bad guys. From that lens, I wanted to basically understand how um, teachers who teach the program in English and English language schools, how do they interact with the program? How, do, how does their interactions influence the way they teach? And how do they integrate their students? So I got to interview 18 teachers from across the province. Four of them had uh, representative uh, testimonies of their lived experiences because the article is in French. So I asked the Francophone readers, French teachers, and others who are in the French-speaking public to listen to their testimonies in a reflexive manner. And I got this idea from a former uh, professor at OEZ, Roger Simon. He talks about the idea of testimony and how we should listen to it reflexively. Can you briefly explain what you mean in a reflexive manner? So I'm using Roger Simon's formulation. So to think reflexively when listening to testimonies would involve listening to what the testimony is saying closely, but then at the same time being aware of the gaps in what is being said or the gaps in your own knowledge and your inability to understand the story because of those gaps. So you want to identify the gaps in what you are listening to, but then you also want to ask yourselves, what questions do I need to ask in order to have answers to those gaps? And then when you do that, then you have to ask yourself, why am I asking these questions? What do these questions say about me? The whole purpose of this endeavor is to decenter ourselves from our own egos and to basically be more empathetic. So Roger Simon really stipulates that we inherit the past. Because we inherit the past, the past calls out to us and requires us to pass judgment or to ultimately 
develop our understanding or to listen to the past and to refine our own ethical positioning in the world we live in, like our own sense of right or wrong. So you want to be touched by the past, touched by the testimonies of these ghosts, and these testimonies can be seen as counsel, and they're telling us a message. But we have to listen reflexively and carefully to understand what the message is so that we can decenter ourselves as humans, decenter ourselves from our egos, and to ultimately change and adapt and grow and become more human in a way. And in a way, it re relates to my earlier comment about maintaining or preserving our dignity and integrity as humans. The best way to grow is by being reflexive, self-reflexive, and being able to take distance from our own egos or take critical distance from the claims we make about the world we live in. And I was wondering maybe if you can give us the highlights of what were your major findings. The highlights, in a way, are not necessarily surprising because all the testimonies basically point to how the program does not make room for English speakers nor does it make room for other cultural communities. The history program really is a program where the protagonist of the history are French or Francophone Quebecois, and you don't have a sense of the experiences and lived realities of English speakers or other marginalized communities where they are the protagonists of their own stories. So there is a sense of exclusion. So it's ultimately a difficult history program to teach, because teachers, be they English speakers or French speakers, they really want the program to be relevant to their students' lived experiences. They want their students to connect to the material that they are transmitting, the worthwhile knowledge that they are mandated to transmit to their students. So there's this lack of connectivity, there's this lack of coherency, and students and teachers feel that they are excluded and they feel that they are not welcome in Quebec society because there is that lack of respect. It goes back to my whole idea of restoring people's sense of dignity and integrity. People want to feel complete and fulfilled, and either as individuals or as members of their many we groups of belonging. And if they don't see an image of who they are in the program, and if it's something that is interesting but that doesn't resonate with their own lived experiences is imposed onto them, and there is this punitive approach where you have to pass the June exam in order to, to graduate high school, then yeah, it's gonna make you feel like you're not welcome and uh, you're not wanted here. Can you explain what you mean by uh, the term permanent dichotomy? So permanent dichotomy would refer to that linguistic dichotomy I was speaking to earlier, where you have this simplified understanding or imposition of the English-French or French-English dynamic where you have two groups that are competing within the same territorial unit seeking to regenerate themselves and to feel fulfilled ultimately in an autonomous and distinct manner. So there's this competition between French and English in a way, but it also ultimately speaks to the Francophone quest for social justice, where they want to maintain their own understanding of their historical past, which is they came, we lost, we are survivors. So the conquest is really the cornerstone, pivotal to uh, the historical consciousness and historical memory of many Francophones in Quebec. And now everything we do in Quebec, is kind, especially when it comes to the teaching of history, is held hostage to that dichotomy, the English-French dichotomy, where there's this culture, identity, language, it's always us versus them, but it's always English versus French, and there's never any nuance. And that dichotomy is what others and silences the experiences of First Nations peoples and other historic communities like Black Quebecers who have become marginalized. So we talk about systemic racism. Uh, we talk about the residential school system. We talk about the ongoing mistreatment of First Nations in Quebec and in Canada. So all these lived experiences are silenced. They are withdrawn and they're not present in the history program. So what's interesting is in the study, some teachers talk about English speakers, but a lot of them also, knowing that they're English speakers and they're also privileged in their daily lives, are more concerned about their students in the classroom who happen to be marginalized.
So their main concern sometimes, most of the time, turns to the needs of their students who come from different minority groups, visible minority groups, or marginalized communities. So there's this concern to help them and to make them feel that they are part of Quebec society, but the program does not permit them to do that. Do you have any insight on how these teachers, knowing that they would like to help those students that feel excluded, did they talk about any approach external to uh, what the Quebec history program dictates that you have to do? What would be their approaches to promote inclusivity of uh, their students that might feel excluded? So when it comes to the teaching of history in Quebec, uh, history teachers have to follow the curriculum, but there's about 20% wiggle room where they're allowed to do their own thing, and that's where that creativity can come in and that initiative can come in. The teachers I spoke to, they do their own legwork sometimes. They go and they do research and they come up with different experiences. They seek different narratives and perspectives, and they either do it through the use of primary sources and they bring in primary sources that kind of contradict the main message or storyline and then they want to bring in diverse perspectives and say why would someone say that what was going on back then what was the motive behind the person saying this what might have been different ways of understanding this historical event or or this happening from the past but from a different perspective from the experiences of the minority uh, community members based on the sources that are available other teachers become their own historians and they do their own research, and they collect all sorts of resources that they bring in, and they share with their students, depending on the needs of their students in the classroom context. Uh, other teachers sometimes go through the curriculum or the textbook, and then they kind of stop, and they say, let's reflect. What is the textbook saying? Why are all the factory bosses English? Who are the factory workers? Why don't they mention the factory workers? Were they French? Were they English? And then he kind of disrupts that myth where all English peoples are, are rich or they, you know, they're factory owners, or, and, and he disrupts that. I know that you have also testimonies, uh, specific testimonies of the certain teachers that, uh, that responded to the study that you'd like to read out to us. Yes, I do. So I have two teachers in mind who I think will be able to exemplify the message or the key idea that I'm trying to get across. So as part of the study, teachers were asked to write uh, different narratives, different stories of their lived experiences by hand. And I'm focusing on two key questions that I asked them. In the first instance, I asked them to narrate or recite a story of how they felt impelled to question and correct the representation of English speakers in Quebec's official history program, the one that they teach. And then in the second narrative, I asked them to explain how they would rework the program to make room for an account for English speakers' presence and contributions. And I also asked them to include a description of the pedagogical measures they would bring in in that regard. I have two testimonies that I want to share. The first person, obviously their name is not their real name, so I named the first person Jack. I'm going to read uh, an extract from the article, the chapter. So, at the time of the study, Jack was 37 years old. He self-identifies as Canadian. His mother tongue is English. His first official language spoken is English. And he speaks English both inside and outside his home. Although he's from Ontario originally, he had spent 14 years in Quebec. He has taught history in both secondary three and four in mainly the broader Gatineau region. He has taught both the history of Quebec and Canada and 20th century history in secondary four. So in response to the first narrative question where he felt impelled to question and correct representation of English speakers in the program, he writes, a section of the history book referred to a slave graveyard in the eastern townships called N-Word Rock. One day, a student named George, who was black, found this section, even though it wasn't part of the lesson for that day. He was so mad that he was on the verge of tears. I calmed him down, stopped the work that we were doing, and had the students scratch the word out. We then did a spur-of-the-moment lesson on slavery in the British Empire, black loyalists, and the Underground Railroad. I felt that I had to give my students more context to the situation, find out what they knew and understood about slavery in colonial North America, and provide space for a positive reflection of black Canadians in Quebec. This incident 
also started me down a path to thinking and criticizing textbooks and curricula and their portrayal of Anglophones. So this short paragraph is a great example of how a teacher basically feels impelled to question and correct the representation of, or the absence even, or the misrepresentation, or even the vile representation using the N-word of citizens of Quebec, and they happen to be English-speaking. So for the second task, where he explains how he would rework the program to make room and account for English speakers' presence and contributions, Jack writes, My remedial history would be presented as a series of testimonials of forgotten voices. I would include primary sources, and I would either use the narrator's exact words or stay close to their words. As much as possible, I would try to tell the history from the point of view of the different parts that make up the English-speaking community. That is, I would try to highlight all the cultures and socioeconomic groups that make up the English community, and I would try to include stories from all the geographic locations where they lived. The material would come in printed form, and it would have a QR code, which would then link to an interactive map and timeline that would contextualize that person's lived experiences. I would do something cheeky even, like pretend their stories are taped into the present textbook over top the current narrative. Most importantly, my history would be one of carving out the space that would show that the English-speaking community isn't the other. The English-speaking community isn't just rich Anglo elites. It was actually a force in the history of our country. The second testimony is from uh, a person called Diana. Again, their name is not their real name, it's a pseudonym. Diana was 40 years old at the time of the study. Having spent 38 years in Quebec and 20 in Montreal, Diana is of a mixed background, North African, Spanish, and British. Her mother tongue is English. Her first official language spoken is English. She writes, I have always sought to complement the program out of necessity and felt a strong responsibility to expose students to all histories, especially their own, which oftentimes are marginalized or excluded from the official curriculum. This brings me back to several incidents I noticed over the years, in particular Black History Month. Black history is not covered thematically in the history textbook, but rather a few important black Quebecers are given portrait, quote-unquote, portrait mentions. In school, black history has either not been taught or has been heavily influenced by American content with the usual figures. Once I began really looking at what the history books grades 9 and 10 were teaching, I realized it was so little and wondered if this was just another aspect of Quebec history which has been molded to indoctrinate young minds and shape the Quebec nationalist survivor nationalism narrative. What I did was develop through research and activity with pictures, video, and a slideshow of major minor events in Canadian history of the black experience, which I show in February and during teaching all year round. I supplement the material by discussing important moments, anecdotal stories, and characters of black Canadians who have been part of our collective history. Everyone's histories, stories are important, whether they are the dominant group or not. For the second task, when uh, she talks about how she would rework the program to make it more representative of her students, she writes, in my view, the history program in Quebec is written and presented in such a way as to indoctrinate and perpetuate the myth that French Canadians are victims, helpless in a sea of English bent on assimilating them. Evidently, the inclusion in the textbooks of the influence and contributions of all is the first part. How the history is written is the second. More objectivity and careful analysis of the language used when writing about historical events, people, is necessary. The third part has to do with activities, debate, role-playing. All this is necessary to allow students to debate and see many sides of political, social, economic issues that have occurred over time. Teachers need materials, lessons, to allow students to interact with history rather than memorize the players or bloody documents to pass the exam. Most importantly, it cannot be French Canadians versus everybody else. Importance and value must be given to all peoples, whether the majority or minority, no matter the language. But are you surprised? No, not at all. I'm not surprised. In a selfish way, I feel relieved because it, it provides evidence, albeit in a limited way, because we cannot generalize. 
but it does bring in some sort of data that speaks to my own assumptions of how history teaching happens in Quebec. And to that point, what did you find are the major challenges for history teachers who teach Quebec history in English schools particularly? The main challenge is to make the content relevant to their students, to their students' lived experiences, while also preparing them to successfully pass the June exam. That June exam puts a lot of pressure because students need to pass that exam. And in English language school, sometimes it's even harder because the story they have to transmit or make sure that they understand is one where, they're, where their students' experiences and their own experiences as Quebecers are excluded from the point of view where they are the protagonist of their stories. What do the teachers experience in terms of questioning their own identity when teaching the Quebec history? What are they also examining in terms of their own sense of belonging in Quebec society, their own place as a history teacher of mixed heritage, like one of your testimonials revealed? I can say in response to your question, is that teachers are very professional when it comes to doing their job and they have to teach the program, and they do. During that 20% wiggle room I mentioned earlier, they are free to bring in whatever topics they want. So it's during those moments where they can be creative and experiment or, or bring in the experiences or the perspectives that are missing. What I can say is that many teachers end up playing the devil's advocate where they want their students to understand the Francophone perspective, even though they know that it's a hard sell sometimes because they don't always necessarily <laughs> believe it. And I think it reinforces that English-French dichotomy where the dichotomy that promotes a, we are the survivors uh, narrative, like that survivor mentality. But at the same time, they play devil's advocate to explain why Bill 101 was important, why it's important to protect French and preserve the French culture in North America. They want their students to understand the Francophone perspective. But I think the challenge then becomes explaining to their students why francophones do not understand their perspectives or rather are indifferent to their lived experiences. So what direction would you like to steer your future work now in order to sort of feel like you're completing the work that you've begun? I really want to dig deeper and write more theoretical work. I already have a book coming out this fall by the University of Toronto Press titled Historical Consciousness and Practical Life, a Theory and Methodology. It offers, I believe, in my humble opinion, a novel approach to understanding historical consciousness and how it works, a novel approach to how we interpret time's flow and use that information to position ourselves regarding social problems with historical roots, which I call happenings, they can either be unexpected happenings or ongoing happenings from prior times, but that are always present. So the book really offers a, a theory and methodology for understanding how our historical sense-making really works. And it looks at the individual as an actor that is embedded in our different communities and epistemologies of belonging. So it offers an understanding of how our sense-making, how our thinking works, how our positioning works, depending on, obviously, the context and the social issue that we're looking at. And how would you relate that to... How does it manifest in education, or in the educational realm, uh, among the English-speaking uh, minority? In the educational realm, for be it the English-speaking minority or other minorities around the world or for other commu marginalized communities, and even non-marginalized or non-minority communities, dominant communities, the whole idea would be to bring that methodology into the classroom and have students apply it onto themselves and their partners, their peers, and to really look at how they construct the knowledge they create or how they construct the historical knowledge they use or they produce to give meaning to the world. 
And through employing a self-reflexive approach, they can understand why they're thinking in a certain way or the cultural scripts and ideas that are involved in how they understand how history works and the cultural scripts and ideas that inform their partner's understanding of what history is and how it works. So it's through the self-reflexive approach, comparing and contrasting how their sense-making, their historical sense-making works and influences their historical consciousness regarding a particular social problem with historical roots. So it's really a question of, it's a structured methodology for examining how history our understanding of historical knowledge or how we use historical knowledge to understand the world, how that influences our positioning, our positionality in the world. How does it gain even more meaning within the Quebec educational system? It's a way of working together to help create and maintain each other's integrity and dignity as humans, to help create and maintain each other's right for their quest to feel complete and fulfilled in their lives. It's, again, like Roger Simon, it's about reinforcing or maintaining our shared humanity with each other. Too. So we can reinforce our shared humanity by having us reflect on how our thinking works, how our sense-making works, and how we construct historical knowledge in, line, in our minds, and how we use that information to position ourselves regarding social problems that we probably face in common mm -hmm. with whoever else is in the classroom or even in other classrooms across the province. Thank you, Paul, for that. And uh, uh, we look forward to hearing about your future work. We sense the passion in your voice and, of course, the need for further reflection on these topics. So hope to see you again. I hope so, too. I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you to Islet and Questgren for this wonderful opportunity. This podcast is part of the Islet Impact Project, funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage. Islet Impact is an educational initiative of the Quebec English-speaking communities research network known as Questgrin, which also receives funding from the Secrétariat aux relations avec les Québécois d'expression anglaise, the Canadian Institute for Research on Linguistic Minorities, and Concordia University.